Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to discuss about a pretty common condition, gout. So without further ado, let's get started. Historically, gout has been referred to as the king's disease, or the disease of kings, for a simple and powerful reason, its association with a lavish lifestyle. Famous historical figures, including King Henry VIII, Alexander the Great, and Isaac Newton, were documented to have suffered from gout. Gout is caused by an excess of uric acid in the blood, a condition called hyperuricemia, which leads to the formation of sharp, painful crystals in the joints. In other words, gout is a classic rheumatological condition characterized by the deposition of monosodium urate crystals in joints and soft tissues. These needle-shaped crystals are the direct cause of the inflammation and pain associated with gout. To understand them fully, let's see how they formed first. Monosodium urate is the sodium salt of uric acid. At the body's normal physiological pH, around 7.4, uric acid, which is a weak acid, is mostly in its deprotonated ionized form known as urate. This urate anion readily combines with sodium ions present in the blood and other body fluids to form monosodium urate. Hyperuricemia is the high uric acid in the blood, particularly more than 7 mg per deciliter. This condition results from either an overproduction of uric acid, which occurs in approximately 10% of the cases, or in about 90% of the cases, an under-excretion of the uric acid. Like I said before, gout was once considered a sign of a high-class lifestyle. This is because the diets of monarchs and aristocrats were abundant in red meats, organ meats, and different types of seafood. They also consumed vast quantities of alcohol, particularly beer and fortified wines, which are known to increase the concentration of uric acid in the body. However, one of the biggest sources of overproduction is the high cell turnover rate. Conditions with high rates of cell death and replication lead to an increased turnover of purines. As these purines are metabolized, they are converted into uric acid. For instance, among the proliferative and lymphoprolific disorders like leukemia, lymphoma, or polycythemia vera, the rapid proliferation of blood cells generates a large load of purines, overwhelming the body's ability to excrete uric acid and leading to hyperuricemia. Severe widespread psoriasis, with its rapid turnover of skin cells, can also increase the purine load. A particular life-threatening example is tumor lysis syndrome, a complication of cancer chemotherapy treatment, where a large number of tumor cells are destroyed rapidly for releasing vast amounts of intercellular contents, including purines, into the bloodstream. On the other hand, an impaired renal function is a major risk factor for inadequate uric acid elimination. The kidneys are responsible for the majority of uric acid excretion, so any condition that impairs renal function, most notably chronic kidney disease, can lead to under-excretion of uric acid and subsequent hyperuricemia. Some medications can also inhibit uric acid excretion. These include diuretics like hydrochlorothiazide and furosemide, low-dose aspirin, and immunosuppressants like cyclosporine. An acute gout attack is an intense inflammatory response triggered by the presence of monosodium urate crystals in a joint. It is not caused by the crystals themselves, but by the body's immune reaction to them. The process begins when MSU crystals, which have been deposited in the joint due to chronic hyperuricemia, are shed into the synovial fluid. Resident macrophages in the joint recognize these crystals as a threat, activating a key intracellular complex called the NLRP3 inflammasome. This activation leads to the cleavage and release of the powerful pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-1 beta. IL-1 beta then orchestrates a massive inflammatory cascade, attracting a large number of neutrophils to the joint. These neutrophils attempt to clear the crystals, but in doing so, they amplify the inflammatory response by releasing more inflammatory mediators. This self-reinforcing cycle of cytokine release and immune cell recruitment results in the classic clinical signs of a gout attack. Severe pain, swelling, redness, and warmth in the affected joint. The attack eventually resolves on its own, but the underlying hyperuricemia and crystal deposits remain, setting the stage for future attacks. Typically, gout presents as acute gouty arthritis, a sudden and painful monoticular inflammatory arthritis. The most common site is the first metatarsophalangeal joint, a condition also known as pedagra. However, gout can also affect other joints, including the ankle, knee, wrist, and small joints of the hand. The pain is severe and reaches its peak intensity within 8 to 12 hours. Clinically, the affected joint will be arithmetous, warm, swollen, and tender. Left untreated, an acute attack can last for days to weeks before spontaneously resolving, 
Usually, the acute episode is followed by an intercritical period where the patient is asymptomatic. Nevertheless, if left untreated, gout can progress to chronic tophaceous gout. This is characterized by the formation of tophi, which are subcutaneous or periarticular collections of monosodium urate crystals. Tophi appear as firm, painless nodules, commonly found on the ears, on the elbows, or tendons. They can lead to chronic joint destruction and eventually deformity. Gout is also a systemic disease, and uric acid crystals can deposit in the kidneys, causing uric acid nephrolithiasis and chronic interstitial nephritis. It is also strongly associated with other comorbidities, including hypertension and type 2 diabetes. The diagnosis often starts with a high level of clinical suspicion based on the patient's history and physical exam. A key feature of gout is the acute monoarticular arthritis, the sudden onset of severe pain, swelling, warmth, and redness in a single joint, usually the first metatarsophalangeal. We should pay close attention on the risk factors, a history of hyperuricemia, a diet high in purines, and alcohol, especially beer, diuretic use, or a family history of gout all increase suspicion. However, for a definitive diagnosis of gout, the gold standard is the microscopic identification of monosodium urate, MSU crystals, in the synovial fluid of the affected joint. The procedure starts with an arthrocentesis. Essentially, this is the aspiration of synovial fluid from the inflamed joint. This is a crucial step not only for diagnosis, but also to rule out septic arthritis, which can mimic gout and is a medical emergency. Then we proceed a microscopic examination. The fluid is analyzed under a polarized light microscope. MSU crystals are needle-shaped and, importantly, exhibit strong negative birefringence. This means that when viewed through the microscope, they appear yellow when aligned parallel to the compensator axis and blue when perpendicular. The presence of these crystals, especially with the neutrophils, is a definitive diagnosis of gout. In clinical practice, when synovial fluid analysis isn't feasible, the 2015 American College of Rheumatology European League Against Rheumatism classification criteria for gout are a valuable tool. This is a point-based system that uses clinical, laboratory, and imaging features. For the criteria to apply, the patient must have at least one episode of peripheral joint swelling, pain, or tenderness, points being then assigned for specific features. A score of eight or more out of a possible 23 points classifies a patient as having gout. This provides a standardized, evidence-based approach to diagnosis when definitive crystal analysis isn't an option. Treatment has two distinct phases, managing the acute attack and providing long-term prophylaxis. For an acute attack, the goal is to reduce inflammation and pain. First-line therapies are NSAIDs like indomethacin or naproxen, colchicine, which inhibits neutrophil chemotaxis and activation, and corticosteroids, either orally or via intraarticular injection. For long-term management, the goal is to achieve and maintain a serum uric acid level below 6.0 mg per deciliter, or below 5.0 mg per deciliter for tophaceous gout, using urate-lowering therapy. The first-line agents are xanthine oxidase inhibitors like allopurinol or febuxostat, which block uric acid production. Uricosuric agents like probenicid can be used as an alternative. These medications increase renal excretion of uric acid. It's crucial to remember that you should not initiate ULT during an acute attack, as rapid fluctuations in uric acid levels can worsen the inflammation. Here we wrap things up. If you found this information helpful, please give this video a like, subscribe to the channel for more health insights, and let me know in the comments what other topics you'd like me to cover next. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.